And uh, we have been doing an extended summer message series called Summer Mixtape. And uh, that's been going for several weeks now. And I get the pleasure of wrapping all this up. This has been a series about Paul's letters to the various churches around the known world directly after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And uh, as if you go to church here, you know I'm going to do a recap. <laughs> I love a good recap. And so if you haven't been here, that's awesome, because now I'm going to get you all caught up. Way back on week number one, Pastor Burton kicked things off for us, and he shared with us about Paul's letter to the Galatian church. And the main point of the message was that Christ has set us free and that we are no longer bound by the yoke of slavery to the law. Amen? Then on week number two... I shared about uh, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, and the main idea that we wanted to get across on that week is that Christians are to be filled with grace, peace, and love until they overflow and spill out onto the people around them. And uh, being filled with grace and peace and love and patience and all that sort of thing will have a profound f uh, effect on the people around us. You know, those people in your life that are in the splash zone, if they experience love and grace and peace and mercy and all of that stuff, it's going to make them know something's different about you. And then when you share the gospel, you share the good news uh, of Jesus to them, it's going to make uh, your presentation much more effective. Um, how many of you guys know that if someone's grumpy and mean and negative, you don't care what they have to say? <laughs> usually. Uh, week number three, my son Josiah shared about Paul's letter to the church at uh, Philippi. He discussed uh, choices and prayer and conflict and peace and how believers should rejoice in suffering while they're serving as well as during times of strength. And uh, believers can rejoice in Christ no matter what's going on. How many of you guys know that we don't have perfect lives, that uh, things go sideways, that we hit speed bumps? Uh, sometimes we fall in a vast crevasse. <laughs> uh, sometimes you don't just get off the trail, you get way off the trail, right? Things go wrong. Things explode. Things go bad. But we can survive and make it if we are in Christ and Christ is in us and we are with him. Uh, my mom who uh, has served the Lord my whole life, uh, she always says, if it wasn't for Jesus, uh, it would have all been over a long time ago. And uh, I know that's true for me. I've, I've been up against some hard stuff in my life. And if I didn't serve the Lord and I didn't have him in my life, I know that I would have given up a long time ago. And so we need to make sure that we are rejoicing in all things because no matter what, if he is with us, that's enough. Uh, week number four, I spoke about Paul's letter to the Colossian church. And the big idea of that message was that when we know who we are and who we follow, we will not be easily fooled. And the application or the challenge or the action step that we had that day was spend time understanding your identity in Christ so that you can identify false teaching and know that you know that you know who you are in Christ and walk in that identity. How many of you guys know that there's a lot of people out there trying to trick you? There's a lot of people out there trying to pull you off the path, trying to uh, confuse people. Uh, we talked specifically about a lot of people that are online making TikTok videos and YouTube videos, and they're sprinkling a little bit of scripture and a little bit of Christianese into what they have to say, uh, but then they're teaching stuff that's not true, stuff that's false, stuff that is leading people astray and getting people off the path. Well, last week, uh, week number five, Pastor Burton uh, shared about Thessalonians. Uh, but I wanted to share one of the other passages that he shared out of Proverbs because it kind of springboards where we're headed today. He shared Proverbs 3, 6 through 8, and it says this, Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing in your body and strength in your bones. And the, uh, the big idea that he shared was, don't be satisfied with your current level of spiritual maturity. Keep growing. And I just want to reemphasize that. You know what? The easy part is accepting God's love and grace. The easy part is 
putting your faith and trust in him because he's God. He's awesome, right? Um, We've talked about how it's easy to love God because he's merciful and gracious and awesome. But the hard part is continuing to grow, putting one foot in front of the other. On Monday morning, after the the emotions and the adrenaline of having an awesome worship experience on Sunday has worn off, and you wake up early on Monday morning because you got to go to work, you might not be feeling it, right? But that's because we got to keep going. We got to keep reading the word and keep praying and keep spending time with other uh, believers. And and our challenge uh, with that is that we need to grow in things like holiness and work ethic and purity and integrity. Uh, Pastor Burton shared uh, four words that all begin with F uh, using beautiful pastoral alliteration because we all know if we've gone to church for any time, if a pastor can get all of his main points to uh, be a word that starts with the same letter, that's awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, alliteration equals anointing is what I've heard. Um, but the four, uh, the, the four words that he shared was faithful, fruitful, functional, and fulfilled. And those are the things that we're supposed to be in our walk with God. With God. Ugh, I don't know, it came out weird. <clears throat> so in our walk with God, we're supposed to be those things. And so the, all of that leads up to this week, and I get the privilege of, of wrapping it all up. And so uh, week six, this morning, we are going to uh, take a look at Paul's letter to Philemon, which is a book in the Bible. Um, and, uh, it's one that maybe you haven't never noticed because it's only like one page long. And so a lot of times you flip right past it. Um, but this is also a little bit different than the other letters that we've looked at so far in this series, because this letter goes to a person, not a city. All those other, uh, letters went to a city that was supposed to be distributed and taught to the churches in that city. And this is going directly to a person who was, uh, hosting a house church. And so that's a little bit different. Um, Because people are kind of unfamiliar uh, with this book, we're going to take a little extra time to to give some context. But like Paul's other letters, uh, Philemon is a book in the New Testament. Um, The letter or book was written approximately 60 AD. So that's pretty awesome. It was, uh, you know, during Paul's ministry, um, uh, directly following uh, Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Uh, This letter is the shortest of all Paul's writings, and it deals with the evil of slavery. And uh, so this letter suggests uh, that Paul was in prison at the time of the writing, and that uh, Philemon, the guy he's writing to, was a slave owner. And he was also the host of a house church. Sounds like quite a conflict, right? (laughs) How can this guy be a slave owner and be in charge of a church? Well, that's exactly why Paul's writing this letter. We know that in the other letters, Paul was writing these because these churches had a very specific thing that they were dealing with. In one of the letters, he really pounds and and emphasizes, hey, sexual immorality is going on. Knock it off, right? He, he, he writes to another church and he says, hey, listen, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of uh, backbiting and a lot of gossip. Cut that out. In this other church, he, he writes to them and he says, hey, listen, you're abusing the spiritual gifts. You're not loving one another. You're doing this. You're doing that. Uh, he's writing these letters. Remember, these mixtapes that he's sending are for specific people because they're dealing with specific things. And in this particular case, he's writing this letter to Philemon because there's obviously this weird conflict where he's a slave owner and he's a convert. He's a Christian and he's hosting a church at his house. And so this obviously needs to be addressed. And so during the time of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, Philemon, he had made a journey to that city. He heard Paul's preaching and he became a Christian. And he had a slave uh, named Onesimus. And Onesimus robbed Philemon and he ran away and he went to Rome. Well, at that time, Paul just happened to be in Rome. And so they, they, uh, they connected. Well, legally, Onesimus, the slave, was still the property of Philemon. And so Paul wrote to smooth the way for his return to his master. This is very interesting. Uh, 
And so through Paul's witnessing to him, Onesimus had become a Christian. And Paul wanted Philemon to accept Onesimus as a brother in Christ and not merely a slave. And so I want to read a few of the key verses in Philemon so that we get an idea of how he's presenting this. And so in verse 6, it says, And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. I want to pause here because how many of you guys know that when we read about Jesus' teachings, we think, man, those are great ideas. That was one good dude. And in our minds, we think, man, that is awesome. But how many of you guys know when it's our turn to actually do those things that Jesus Jesus teaches, it's a lot harder, right? So Paul is saying, hey, I know you know what's going on, but I want you to do it. He says, I want you to put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. So he's saying, hey, listen, you're getting the good stuff, but here's where the rubber meets the road. Let's look at verse 16. It says, he is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Paul's making this great connection. He's saying, hey, listen, this is what he's going to be to you, but that he's already that to me. And I'm the Apostle Paul, so listen up. In verse 16, he says, he is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave. Uh, If we skip down to verse 18, it says, If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. Paul is really trying to pave the way for him to understand that, listen, there is a new way to do this. There is a better way to do this. And it doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what the law says. In other letters, Paul had warned slave owners that they had to be responsible towards their slaves and showed slaves as responsible moral beings who feared God. Much more directly in this book, in this letter, in Philemon, uh, Paul presented Onesimus as a Christian brother instead of a slave. When an owner can refer to a slave as a brother, the slave has reached a position in which the legal title of slave is meaningless. There's something bigger than the law. It doesn't matter what the Roman Empire says. It doesn't matter what what the soldiers say. It matters what God says. It matters what Jesus says. Now, the early church did not attack slavery directly, but it laid the foundation for a new relationship between the owner and the slave. It's kind of like many social issues that we're dealing with today. Sometimes there's not much we can do about what the law says, but what we can do is change people's hearts. We can tell them there's something bigger and better than what we've come up with, what the world has come up with, what man has come up with. There's some better ideas and they come from God. Paul attempted to unite both Philemon and Onesimus with Christian love so that Uh, emancipation would become inevitable. If a heart is changed, it doesn't matter what the law says or what human thoughts we come up with. If we can be talked into something, we can be talked out of something. But if our heart is transformed, then real change happens. Only after the exposure to the light of the gospel could the institution of slavery truly and completely die. And that's why we see even today it pops up on every continent, all around the world. Because it's a heart change that has to take place. It's a transformation in who people are, not just what people think. Perhaps nowhere in the New Testament is the distinction between the law and grace so beautifully portrayed. You see, both Roman law and Mosaic law of the Old Testament gave Philemon the right to punish a runaway slave who was considered his property. But the covenant of grace through the Lord Jesus allowed both master and slave to fellowship in love on an equal basis in the body of Christ. 
Because God's law is higher than our law. God's law is more important than man's law. For us, that means employers and political leaders and corporate executives and parents can follow the spirit of Paul's teaching by treating Christian employees, co-workers, and family members as equal and important members of the body of Christ. Christians in modern society must not view helpers or subordinates as mere stepping stones to help them achieve their ambitions. As Christian brothers and sisters, we must receive uh, and, and distribute gracious treatment, equal treatment to all people. In addition, all Christian leaders must recognize that God holds them accountable for the treatment of those who work for them or under them. Whether, they're, they're, uh, whether the helpers are Christian or not. I mean, how many of you guys uh, deal on a daily basis with people who are not a part of the body of Christ? But we're still called to love them. Amen? They must eventually answer us, leaders, people, Christians. We must eventually answer for how we treat other people. Paul writes in Colossians 4.1, Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Uh, we've all heard the golden rule based on Matthew 7.12, uh, right? It says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets, Right? What's the greatest commandment? We, we, we say it over and over and over here at Life Christian Church. The greatest commandment is love God and love others. How can we love others if we're treating them as if, as if they're below us? That there's something to be used to get what we want. We can't. We can't represent the love that God has called us to love others with if we're using or abusing other people. This is true for everyone, including those we might have authority over. I mean, some of us in this room are, are in a, a position of authority of some sort. But those people that are below us are equal and demand to be treated equally. Ultimately, Paul writes this, though, in Galatians 3.28. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Because it doesn't matter what's legal. It doesn't matter what's morally, uh, what's morally accepted by the world, right? We have to concentrate on what God says is moral and what God says is spiritually beneficial. Think about this. Think about all the things in this world right now today <laughs> in our lives that are legal and or socially accepted that we know are absolutely not moral and they're absolutely not spiritually beneficial. I mean, we could make a list of hundreds of things that we could leave this door and go do legally and, and uh, socially acceptable that would be completely immoral and completely not uh, beneficial to us spiritually. With all that being said, the big idea that I want to drive home today that, that uh, I want you to take with you is this. Don't be normal. <laughs> don't do what everybody else is doing. We don't want to be normal. We want to be awesome, right? We want to be like Jesus. Jesus wasn't normal. <laughs> Jesus was, was extraordinary. He was extra ordinary, right? We don't want to just go with the flow and do what everybody else does. Have you guys heard the old saying? Uh, my, I know my parents use this. Um, you've probably heard some form of it, but your parents would ask you if everyone jumps off a bridge, are you going to jump off one too? It still, it still applies <laughs> now that I'm an adult. If everyone else is doing it, do I just do it? No. How many of you guys know some real goobers? <laughs> They're probably doing some stuff you shouldn't do, right? Our challenge as Christians is to set the pace, to set the tone for moral behavior, showing kindness and grace and uh, forgiveness 
in greater measure than what is culturally accepted. Because what is culturally accepted? A lot of garbage, right? The bar is set very low for people. You can be a total degenerate and be better than a lot of people around you. But that's not the standard. The world is not the standard. God is the standard. Jesus is the standard. Let's dig a little deeper into this because obviously Paul is tackling a huge culture clashing issue. And uh, that's the same thing that we're called to do uh, today. Uh, Philemon uh, 15 and 16, let's look a little bit closer at that. Uh, I'll reread uh, verse 15. It says, It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. That's an interesting way of saying that this uh, slave robbed you and then ran away. It says, you seem to have lost him for a little while. Well, according to the Biblical Theology Study Bible, in this verse, Paul de-emphasizes the reason behind Onesimus' absence by using the passive voice, which encourages Philemon to see God as the agent and to attribute the absence to God's mysterious purposes. In other words, he's trying to tell him God intended this separation for good. He intended it for this opportunity for me to tell you that you're a bonehead. (laughs) He's trying to tell him that God separated you so that he could become a believer. You could be reunited and be brothers forever. So let's look at verse 16. It says, he is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Again, according to the Biblical Theology Study Bible, Christians are no longer to regard others according to human categories. As brothers and sisters in Christ, Christians share a bond that transcends the legal master-slave relationship. They become slaves to one another through love, and that tie lasts beyond eternity. We are brothers bound together forever. When a master is expected to treat a slave as a brother in Christ and as a representative of the Apostle Paul, the institution of slavery is completely subverted. How many of you guys know that there's laws on the books that people break every day? So what's more important, for the law to be switched or for people's hearts to be changed, for people to see something evil for being evil. This is what Paul is teaching the church with all of these letters, whether it's sexual immorality or it's uh, uh, gossip or it's whatever, whatever issue, whether it's the evil of slavery, he's writing all these letters to say there's a bigger, better way to live. A bigger, better way, way bigger and better than the law, better than human culture, better than so- social acceptance, better than what people think is okay. How many of you guys know that even in this room, we would all disagree on what's okay and what's not okay? But there's something bigger and better than that, and it's the way of Christ. It's the way of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17, Paul writes this, So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. George Eldon Ladd in A Theology of the New Testament writes this, quote, At one time, the human viewpoint predominated Paul's outlook, and it was then of the greatest importance whether people practiced the legal righteousness and devoted themselves to perfect obedience to the Jewish Torah. From this point of view, Jesus, who had sought out publicans and sinners and who had been crucified as a common criminal, could not possibly be the Messiah, but must be an imposter. However, Now, (laughs) Paul's viewpoint is completely transformed, and these matters of human relationships and religious pride are not quite irrelevant. 
To be in Christ is to be a new creation by virtue of which is entirely different interpretation is given to life and relationships. What's the point of all that? Paul was radically changed by Jesus. He was made new. He thought of everything in this way. He had his conversion experience and now he thinks of it a different way. He knows there's a better way. He knows that there's the way of Christ. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are also made new. And we're meant to think differently and live differently. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12.1, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We have to allow God to transform us so that we can be a new person. Christians should think different and live different from the culture around us. What Paul is challenging Philemon to do in this letter is that, to think differently, to not just accept what is accepted by everybody else. Jeffrey Krantz in his commentary called Philemon, How to Accept a Runaway Slave as a Brother, explains this, quote, Paul does not make any direct attacks on the notion of slavery, but he does hold Philemon to a standard higher than that of the surrounding culture. Punishment for runaways was severe, but Paul told Philemon not only to withhold punishment, but to embrace Onesimus as an equal. And on top of that, Paul is willing to absorb whatever this might have cost Philemon. Philemon is proof that God isn't just concerned with our good behavior and humility in relationship with him. He is also concerned that we go above that which our culture expects. Now, at the time of Paul's letter, it was socially and legally accepted to charge and punish a runaway slave. Yet, he is challenging Philemon to be different, to set a new, higher standard. Not to just follow what everybody else is doing. How many of you guys know it is easier to just go along to get along? It is easier to just go with the flow. It's easier to just do what everybody else does. But oftentimes that's not the right thing. That's not the higher thing. That's not the way of Jesus. We are called to something much bigger and better than what this bent and broken world has to offer. We need to not be normal, but to be awesome, to be like Jesus. We were born again and made for a new purpose, a new reason. And so we need to set the pace and tone for the moral behavior by showing kindness and grace and forgiveness in greater measure than what is culturally culturally expected. Because how many of you guys know that the cultural bar is set very, very low? We should should be blowing people's hair back with our kindness and our love and our grace and our forgiveness and our patience. People should be blown away by our lives because we've embraced a higher way, a better way, the Jesus way. Before I close this message with prayer, I want to very briefly explain how this happens. Like, what does it mean to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, to be born again, to be made new, to be saved? What it means to be a Christian or a Christ follower? How do I get to a place where I've been made new, where I've been transformed, where I am ready for this bigger, better life and purpose that Christ offers? Well, I I want to explain it as simple as possible. And that is that in the very beginning, way back in the day, God created us to be with him. He created us in his image, and he created us to be in relationship. But unfortunately, as we often do, we messed it up, right? We chose ourselves over God, and sin separated us from him. And unfortunately, the bad news, before we get to the good news, is that there's nothing we can do about it. 
on our own, we can't fix it. We can't put our, our lives back together with God. We can't do enough good to, to tip the cosmic scales. We can't do one more good deed over the bad deeds and make it right. The only thing that could fix it was that, that Jesus came and paid the price. He paid the price for us and then he, he rose from the dead, which proved that it was all true. If he would have just died, that would have been the end. But he didn't. He rose again to prove that there's life after death. He paid the price for our sins. He rose again. And everyone who puts their faith and trust in them, in him, will be saved. You'll have eternal life. And the, and the best part of that is that that eternal life begins as soon as you make that decision. That's the easy part, right? The easy part is, is the God part because he's God and he's awesome. And he does the, the amazing part of making us new. The hard part is taking that next step, getting up on Monday morning, like we described earlier, after, after the emotions have worn off and it's time to face life. But there's a big difference. You might have to go to the same job, you might have the same crummy boss. You might have the annoying coworker. Your family situation might not be uh, what you hoped and dreamed it would be. But the difference is that now God's with you. Through every valley, on every mountaintop, he's with you. And you can do it. Uh, Romans 10.9 says, um, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if there's anybody in this room right now, you've never said a prayer like that, you've never acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never uh, put your faith and trust in him, you can do it right now. And I'm not going to have you repeat anything after me. I'm not going to have you raise your hand or come up forward or anything like that. I want it to be from your lips to God's ears. I want you to say it in your own words, but I want you to say, I trust that you died for my sins, that you rose from the dead, and I believe that it's true, and I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I want to pursue that life of something bigger and better than what this world has to offer. And I want you to just go ahead and do that when we pray.